remains in me will bear much fruit. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but underneath are ravenous wolves. By their fruits you will know them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Just so every good tree bears good fruit and a rotten tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a rotten tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So by their fruits you will know them. The Gospel of the Lord. It's a good uh, reminder from um, one of my classes on prophecy in the seminary when the professor asked, how many prophets, how many kinds of prophets are there? And we thought, oh, well, there's major prophets and there's minor prophets and there's guild prophets and we named a couple others and then we ran dry and he just looked and he shook his head and he said, no, there's true prophets and false prophets. It's only two kinds. So I want to encourage us today as we hear these readings, um, again, first and foremost, listening to how they speak to us, and to consider where do we have to be aware of false prophets from within and false prophets from without. A false prophet from within, I think, is on Abram's shoulder. God isn't going to fulfill that promise you're going to need to find another way to have a child. There's no way you can be the father of many nations unless you take matters into your own hand. Hmm. By their fruits, you will know them. And I would say that a clear fruit we need to be aware of if a false prophet from within or from without is telling us to forsake God and take the reins. In general, I would say that if you have to dismiss his promise and take matters into your own hands, you're probably listening to a false prophet. If you weren't here yesterday, I encourage you to go back and listen to the homily, uh, what I would say, I didn't intend it to be this way, but part one, um, talking about uh, Saints John Fisher and Thomas More and all of the drama related to Henry VIII and the acts of succession, um, all the drama that they got pulled into and were beheaded for. Um, but it's interesting, as I looked at the readings this morning, I see what an interesting correlation. Why did Henry VIII have so many wives? Because he wanted a male heir. He was concerned about future generations. He was concerned that if England didn't have a strong male leader, that everything would fall apart all would go to hell in a handbasket. And so because of that fear, the worst case scenario and whatever rationalization he came up with, you know, if I'm going to really be a good king, I need to do whatever it takes to make sure I secure England's future, even if I have to calumniate a friend, even if I have to trump up charges to convict one of my wives of treason and behead her even if it means I have to have all of these adulterous affairs and maybe have a, a male heir through them or whatever the case may be. Beware of those voices that say you must take matters into your own hands and do whatever is necessary because you have to be the one to make this happen. As we know from history, um, Queen Elizabeth was... Um, not a weak leader. 
Whether she made good decisions or bad decisions, she made big decisions. We know the end of the story, too, for Abram. Abram, eventually, the promise was fulfilled as God had said. So I especially want us to be mindful of and prayerful for ourselves in this everyday life, everyday existence, where we have prayers that we're still waiting to see the answer, we have promises that we're still waiting to see how it comes through and when. Um, But I especially encourage us to be praying for those where that promise is related to family life and marriage, for single people longing for a spouse, for couples hoping that their marriage can turn around, for husbands and wives that are praying for the gift of a child. And to pray for them especially when there's that temptation to go toward taking matters into their own hands with things contrary to our faith, contrary to natural law, such as surrogacy, in vitro fertilization, artificial insemination. But let us also be mindful in praying for couples who are tempted to contracept, because they doubt whether or not they have the resources, mentally, physically, whatever the case may be, to support another child. They don't know if their job will provide or if they're going to stay in that job. And how will God provide if that job doesn't work out? I just don't know if we could have another child. And so there's that temptation to contracept, whether by artificial or natural means. And by the way, let me be very clear. This is not limited just to the lay people. I once visited a house of religious, and they were talking about how during the night they put beds out into their gym because they've had so many vocations that they ran out of beds. Sometimes they wonder where they're going to have the money to feed everyone. But one of them said, as I asked them about that decision and how that all worked out, they said, well, because we feel it would be a form of spiritual contraception. If we pray for vocations and God sends them and we tell them, sorry, we can't take you. We don't have enough beds. If God is going to send them to us, we're going to trust that he'll provide new benefactors to build new buildings and receive new vocations. Priests can contracept the gospel by choosing not to preach something they're afraid of what will happen. Maybe a big donor will walk away. So you know what? I'm just going to trim the gospel down to size. Something safe. Something that won't rock the boat. And then we sterilize the word of God. So please understand Me talking about some specifics is not to be exhaustive, nor is it to be um, anything that is singling out any one temptation. This is something for all of us. And we need to pray with and for one another that just as Abram doubted and doubted greatly, we too must remain firm to trust that if God has promised us, and that promise goes with the commandments, God is promising to take care of us if we stay in the lanes and trust with love and surrender that he will give us, whether it's the way that we expected or a way we did not expect, he is and always will be faithful. The Lord remembers his covenant forever. Let us stand and pray. That the church in the world today may be like rich soil, yielding a harvest of a hundredfold. Let us pray to the Lord. That the leaders of our nation in every branch of government will govern in a way which is accountable to God and to us. Let us pray to the Lord. That people who are plagued by doubt or suffering 
may receive the word of God and be converted. Let us pray to the Lord. For protection during these um, difficult days uh, with all of this weather, for protection from winds and floods and rains and lightning, and especially from hurricanes in this hurricane season, we pray to the Lord. That those who are close to death may know true faith and inner peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the full recovery of all of the sick and for blessings on all caretakers, let us pray to the Lord. That those who have gone before us in faith will come to Christ and live forever, especially George and Margaret Herring, let us pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, your graces always achieve their purposes. As we make these requests in prayer, teach us to value your blessings. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human.